Horns up. This is Uppity Unicorn. And since this is right now the month of Ramadan, I thought that it might be a good topic to discuss the masculinity and femininity of the Muslims and Islam. So many people in the West have found themselves on one level or another fascinated with the gender roles, rights, and regulations of men and women who subscribe to the religion. I want to say first, and I cannot stress this enough, I am not one who proselytizes. I am not one who, I'm, I'm not a crusader. Uh, I, I'm, I'm only trying to convey a message regarding masculinity and femininity and um, perhaps demystify and deconstruct some preconceived notions regarding that of Muslims. So again, it is, um, it's April 24th and um, it's, uh, it's, it's Ramadan in 2021. It should be over, I believe it began April 13th and it should be over May 13th, the full 30 days this year. Uh, as, as the Muslims would say, inshallah ta'ala, that is what is going on. So I, um, let's start like this. So masculinity, it's a set of attributes and behaviors or roles, if you will, that are associated with men and boys. Although masculinity is, uh, it's socially constructed, right? Because you see, it, you, see you can see masculinity at variance from culture to culture, from culture to culture, right? Hence why we're having this discussion. Um, research indicates that some behaviors considered masculine, they are biologically influenced, but to what extent masculinity is biologically or socially influenced? I mean, that, that, that's, that's a debate. That's an ongoing debate. So masculinity or being masculine is basically having qualities that are appropriate to or usually associated with a man. So you have traditional masculinity, you have traditional femininity as relatively enduring characteristics, encompassing traits, appearances, uh, interests, behaviors that traditionally have been considered relatively more typical of men and women, respectively. So part of the reason I believe some of masculinity is socially constructed, even though it's based on biology, is because you, we see it varying from culture to culture, right? Like masculinity in the West is not the same as masculinity in the East. Masculinity, according to the various forms of Christianity, is not always the same at, or is not the same as masculinity according to Islam. However, there are some common threads and commonalities. So I want to start here. All right. One of, um, so the Quran itself has, has about 114 people say chapters, but really it's better. You know how people say books of the Bible, that word surah, surah, it's better translated as book than it is as chapter. So you could say it's got 114 books within it, right? And one of them, the fourth one, is called An Nisa. An Nisa means the women, right? So this is the book on the women. So it is entire chapter dedicated to what to do with women, how to treat women. And of course, there's Al Ahzab. Like there's so many different places in the Quran where. Men are instructed on how to engage with women and their masculinity in so many ways is hinged upon and contingent upon how well they are able to fulfill the qualities of masculinity set forth in the book. So according to one translation, and this is uh, one of the first, yeah, you may have heard uh, Marmaduke Pickthall, I believe this was the first uh, man to translate uh, the Quran into English. So Marmaduke eventually changed his name to Muhammad after he converted. Uh, as far as I know, this was a Caucasian man. It says, right? So this is, uh, the Quran is only in Arabic. However, there are English uh, interpretations to help you interpret the meaning. So um, the Quran basically says what could mean in English, men look after women because Allah has made the one of them to excel the other. And because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women 
are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. Right? So, you know, you have that English, that Shakespearean old English like you would in a traditional King James uh, version of the Bible. Anyhow, it says, And for those from, from who ye fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to their beds apart and scourge them. Right? So that's a three-step process. Admonish them, tell them what they're doing wrong. If they don't listen to you, you basically separate from them in bed, as in you don't sleep together at all. No sex, no sleeping together. And then finally, scourge them. Then if, if they obey you, seek not a way against them. Lo, Allah is ever high, exalted, great. Okay, so this is referring to married men and women, right? So it is teaching them as a man you have to be able to admonish a woman. So again, if a woman is above your pay grade then it, and you can't admonish her, probably not the right woman to be, woman to be with for you. Islam does not, um, does not forbid divorce. Uh, while marriage is looked upon as a sacred contract, obviously it, it doesn't prevent it because of course, um, sometimes people are truly unequally yoked and um, it's oppressive to be in that kind of relationship. So... If they're doing something wrong, you admonish them, you know, and then after admonishing them, if that does not work, you separate beds. So there's no sexual relations. There's no, right? You're basically t taking distance from this woman. And most women who love a man, that will affect her to the point where she repents and mends her ways. So the last part says scourge them. And oh my goodness, this is such a debate. But if you look into any, uh, any tough seat, or excuse me, basically any uh, explanation of the Quran, it's basically uh, you can gently um, touch them, right? So with that of uh, the word is miswak for what uh, Muslims clean their teeth with. So something like the size of a toothpaste. Basically, you can lay a finger on them, but you can't lay a hand on them, right? Muslims are not allowed to slap each other. They're not allowed to hit one another in the face. Like there are very big rules and it shouldn't. Whatever you do to her, if you need to grab her, restrain her, tap her, it should not leave a bruise, okay? So there's that. And then there is what the Quran says in chapter 49, verse 13, or you could say book 49, verse 13. Oh, humankind, we have created from you a single male and female. Oh, humankind, we have created you from a single male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. So here you have the equality of the sexes. Uh, and here's the deal. There is equality of the sexes in terms of the nobility of your life, you know, the, the, the rights that you have for protection, the rights that you have for, you know, various things, right? But of course, there are gender roles, and they're not the same. So I would say to some degree, they, they are, it's a symbiotic relation, relationship, but no, they're not equal. Uh, anyhow, um, the Quran in chapter 16, verse 97 says, whoever does righteousness, whether male or female, while, while a believer, we will surely cause him to live a good life. And we will surely give them their reward in the hereafter according to the best of what they used to do. So again, this is talking about the equality of the, the sexes in terms of striving to do good. Whether male or female does a righteous deed, has holiness, has morality, has modesty, has generosity within them, and they act on these things, has piety, whether male or female, they are going to be rewarded equally for these things. In, in a basic sense, so let's say if a woman does something that is more, more difficult for a man to do, then perhaps her reward would be greater, but in a general sense everybody is going to, I hope this makes sense, uh, but equality. <laughs> so uh, in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 71, it says, the believing men and women are allies of one another. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and establish prayer and give zakah. 
So that is just uh, zakah has basically alms giving. That's charity, right? So again, this is a verse of equality and, and talking about how like they're allies to one another, they benefit one another. And it continues to say, and obey Allah and his messenger, those Allah will have mercy upon them. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Okay, so again, I just want to say here, this is not to proselytize. This is not a call to convert to Islam. This is merely a cultural immersion, if you will, into the way of life that is Islam when it comes to masculinity and femininity. And the goal of this video is to show how masculinity in Islam in so many ways is contingent upon the way that a man protects and preserves femininity. So with that being said, I will continue. So in the Quran, book 30, verse 21, it says, and of his signs is that he created for you from yourselves mates, that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed them between you. He played, excuse me, and he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, and that are signs for a people who think or give thought. Right. So again, you have this gender equality theme. I know this is very difficult for some people to believe who have, you know, preconceived notions about Islam and oppression of Muslim women. And we will uh, we'll get there. So, again, um, here's the deal. The Quran gives injunctions primarily to men, right? There are general instructions. There are instructions that are given directly to women. And then there are directives that are given specifically to men. So um, you have the verses that call men the protectors and maintainers of women. Now, where did I put that? Okay, so the word in Arabic is qawam, okay? So qaf, wow, shad the meme, qawam, okay? Right, so because men are the protectors and maintainers of women, or I should say they are charged with being the protectors and maintainers of women because they have a biological degree of strength over the other like one is not like the other so here's where we get to where the genders are not equal right so a man in islam would have to protect and provide for a woman in a way that a woman would never be would never have to protect and provide for a man so if a woman decided to protect and provide for a man that would never be an obligation from god upon her like it is upon a man what that would be for her is charity it would be a beautiful, charitable, philanthropic, generous effort on her part. However, for a man, he it's something that he is charged with. It is a mandate upon him because obviously we're, we're talking biolog biological strength and endurance. We're talking, if we're talking labor and delivery, childbirth and conception, you're talking about, you know, weakness upon weakness where women are going through pregnancy, morning sickness, delivery, postpartum bleeding, uh breastfeeding and the weaning of a child it just so so you see here where the differences start to occur right so the quran gives men um directives of how to interact with orphans how to separate inheritance when somebody dies so many people will say you know well it's unfair that you know a male will have the share of two females which um it says in the Quran, like, you know, if your parents pass away, a male shall have the share of two females, right? If, if he's got two sisters, basically, he's going to get for himself what two women would have to split. And that's also because in Islam, he, a woman's wealth belongs to herself. So you know how women jokingly in the West say, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine? That's actually literally the case in Islam. Whatever money a, a woman makes is her money. And whatever, uh, excuse me, whatever money a wife makes is her money. And whatever money a man makes, like he has to provide for his wife or family. 
So again, she can choose to share, she can choose to help. Uh, we can look at that in the example of uh, Khadija bint Khuwailid, right? That was the very first wife of the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah. May the blessings and peace of God be upon him. This is a uh, etiquette when you mention um, the prophets um, in Islam, you, you speak a blessing after, okay? So... She was about 15 years older than him, uh, allegedly, approximately, and basically she was a very wealthy woman while at the time he was a poor man. So was she obligated to take care of him? No, but of course she was going to from love. And she actually was such a wealthy woman that she ended up taking care of a large portion of Muslims when they were going through a boycott, when the first generation of Muslims were going through boycotts um, among other Arabs who really didn't like this new way of life, okay? Um, so you have injunctives that basically tell men and warn them to be mindful of the relationships of the wombs, right? So your kinfolk, who you're related to, it basically tells men to protect the ties of kinship. Um, there is a time where, uh, a companion of, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to him, you know, who is the most worthy of my companionship, loyalty, goodness, good manners. And he says, your mother. And he's like, okay, well, who after that? And the Prophet Muhammad, again, blessings and peace be upon him. He says, your mother. And he's like, I got it. But who after that? And he says, your mother. And he's like, after that, who? And then he finally says, your father. So basically, here again, you have some, some inequality, right? You have some inequality because the mother has three, three rights over the father, right? Because this is, right, part of the crux of masculinity is the honoring, protecting, and preserving of motherhood and womanhood especially given the biological and oftentimes sociological investment that the woman makes in the child. So a man can be out working all day, you know, earning his living by the sweat of his brow, and that is indeed masculinity and praiseworthy. And that in itself, you know, is worthy of praise. However, you have the woman who typically, you know, when you're sick in the middle of the night, when you've got that boo-boo, when you, you know, it's, it's typically the mother who is catering to and waiting on the child. So the mother tends to have precedence. However, the balance in that is that the woman yields to her husband. Does that make sense? So even if the child yields to the mother, that woman, if she is married, will ultimately yield to her husband. Now, of course, Muslims are human beings. They're not robots. They're not books. So you have lots of deviation from this. And it doesn't mean that you're a horrible, terrible person. But long story short, masculinity in Islam is basically contingent upon a man's ability to protect and preserve motherhood, femininity, and the sanctity of women. So you finally, you have this controversial thing called hijab, right? Strange thing, because the word hijab is only used once or twice in the Quran, and it's not even talking about a head veil, right? It's, it means barrier. It, it's talking about something else. So the first verses of hijab, those were revealed onto the heads of men and not women. What do I mean by revealed on the heads of men, right? Because clearly men are not being asked to cover their hair. What do I mean? Now, there's a, there's a tradition of men covering their hair that is praiseworthy in Islam. However, what I mean is the way that hijab came down as a revelation was first to tell men to lower their gaze, right? So in Islam, a man can only look at a woman one good time because... And every man knows this instinctively. Every heterosexual knows that in that second take, in that second look, there's what it do, what that mouth do, what that booty do, what that like, you know, and I don't mean to be crass, but that first look, you know, it's, it's respectful. That second look is, you know, lustful to, to say the least. 
right? So the men are told, okay, you, you identified this woman, you saw her, now lower your gaze. So he's not supposed to be looking her up and down, lusting after her, gazing for long periods of time at her breast or the shape of her body. Um, this was the first revelation of hijab and, and male-female interactions. And then finally, you have... Um, or after that, you have women who are also told to lower their gaze. And then finally, you have where women are told to cover something that in Arabic is called your juyubi henna. And juyub, <laughs> juyubi henna is still like people have a, in Islam or in Arabic, we call it ikhtilaf. But basically, there's a difference of opinion. There's a difference of opinion among the scholars of the Quran of what juyubi henna means. So at the time of the revelation of that word, verse, the women were dressed the way Christian women of the past would dress. What does that mean? That means they had veils on their head and their bosoms exposed. Okay. So you have a pretty, you, you know, you, you see some of those, you know, old time centuries old themed movies where the women have things on their head and you know long dresses and you know basically exposed cleavage so they were told to take the veil that was already on their head and cover their chest their the neck and the chest area while some people maintain that juyubi henna is just the whole thing just cover it all <laughs> cover all your beauty everything is <laughs> is juyub to the point where you have people who do what I used to do and that is covering the face right so in reality a muslim woman is properly covered if she shows she, her face and hands and i know for just under a decade i covered everything except for my eyes um, and now I, I mean, I don't cover at all. I'm not, um, I'm really not much of a practicing Muslim. I, I personally keep, uh, what, whatever of Islam that I maintain, I keep that in my household. It's, it's between me and my creator and I, I, I don't take it anywhere. I don't take it anywhere else. Um, personal preference. So part of this or if when you finish that verse, it's like, you know, and cover your juyubi henna so that you might be known as free and respectable woman. So at the time this verse was revealed, you had slave women who were topless. And this was made to be a distinction between free believing women and women who were disbelievers or captives. And also to, well, protect the modesty and the decency um, and the chastity of women. Um... You see how men interact sometimes with women who are uncovered, women who are scantily clad. There's a lot of really good girls who model on Instagram or do clothing hauls on YouTube. But, you know, men say all kinds of things to them, even if they're these loving, affectionate mothers and wives. But because of their exposure, I mean, myself included, you know, things happen that, that are incredibly disrespectful and unjust. Right. So. Long story short, you have in Islam a tradition of the man protects, he provides. You have this word called jihad, right? And people say that it means holy war. It literally doesn't. <laughs> literally. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. It, it literally doesn't. It, it actually means struggle. It, it means to struggle or strive, Okay. So there's jihad al-nafs, right? The, the struggle over oneself. And that's a level of spirituality where, let's say, you know, you feel like slapping somebody today, but you decide to hold your peace. That, that is jihad. <laughs> You're a mujahid at that point. Okay, so congratulations. Or um, there is jihad al-asghar, right? Uh, al-asghar and al-asghar, right? So basically, there's the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. So the greater jihad is obviously over your own soul, right? It's a religion that calls people to taking themselves to account and holding themselves accountable for a certain kind of behavior and God consciousness, if you will. And then you have um, what they are calling the lesser jihad, which is how you deal with humanity because your own soul, right? You know, you will be destroyed by your own machinations, the machinations of your own mind before something that is outside of you. So you have, um, let's say everything outside of you is, is basically governance. 
So the governance of a marriage, a divorce, a marketplace, a business, a community, a masjid or a mosque, a, a place of business, a prayer, a, a, a country, right? These are all things that are, uh, or, or the governance of one's own family. So when you talk about uh, jihad and you have uh, the things that Muslims are allowed to fight for, there are four things, and actually, I believe it, uh, Thomas Edison, I believe it was, who, um, what's the Muslim guy's name? I think his name was Keith Ellison. He was sworn into office in Minnesota. He's now the attorney general in Minnesota, I believe. And we have Ilhan Omar, a Somali woman who has now taken his place. But basically, um, he was sworn into office with his hand on the Quran of Thomas Edison. And what a lot of people don't know is that so much of the Bill of Rights in America is actually based off of um, the basic rights of Muslims and Islam, right? So anyhow, that's another uh, subject. But basically, a Muslim is allowed to get into a physical fight, okay? To defend their bodies, if someone, right, like uh, if someone's trying to beat you up, jump you, whatever, you can get into a physical fight to the death of, if you must over protecting your body, over protecting your family, over protecting your property. And fourth, which some people may find controversial, over protecting your reputation. Got it? Those are the four things. Those are the four things that make the engagement in what people are calling holy war <laughs> um, allowable. Okay. So, of course, let's say in Islam, you have the battle of Badr, you have the battle of Uhud, you have the battle of the trenches, and, and so many different things in Islamic uh, history and uh, conquest, if you will. However, uh, you see very few women who are involved in those wars, and, um, except for maybe as nurses, right? Now, you have women like Nusayba and, and very historical women who were on the battlefields pregnant and fighting with knives, with swords, hand-to-hand -hand combat. There were no drones. There were no guns. There were no Kleshnikov, Draco, <laughs> AK-47 assault rifles. It was just, I'm going to wear you out with these hands and catch these hands, Okay. So, and women were allowed to do that. Women were allowed to do that. So perhaps when there were men fleeing the battlefield because their hearts failed them and, you know, women who were, who were stronger at heart, they were able to do that. But traditionally, according to the religion, it is men who protect and sustain and maintain women. So when a Muslim woman marries a man... She does not have to pay a bill, a bill. Doctors, dentists, rent, lights, heating, garbage, whatever it is. She doesn't have to do that. Ever. Now, again, if she does, it's from the kindness of her own heart. And that's a charity on her part. That's a good deed on her part. But as far as obligation goes, that man is obligated to make a way for his family and to find a way to financially support his family. That is Islamic masculinity. The same comes to when you have men who are raping and abusing women and Muslim men have the right to exact a punishment on those men from protecting women and children. Their masculinity is, is, hinged, is contingent upon that, is hinged upon that. Otherwise, you have not made it. Your wife can leave you in Islam. So many people are like, oh, Muslim women are oppressed. Your wife can leave you in Islam if you're not good enough in bed. Your wife can leave you in Islam if you're broke and you can't take care of her. Your wife can leave you if you have a nasty personality and, and you just are too hard to relate to you. She can leave you. She has that right. Now, of course, you have that right as well. But like divorce is in the hand because women are so quick at divorce. I believe there is a, an emotional <clears throat> predisposure. And this is why in America you find most people who are filing for divorce are women. So there is an emotional predisposure 
that women have towards, you know, leaping towards divorce. So in Islam, divorce is in the hands of the man, right? So he's, he's, it basically, it's his right and not hers. But there is something called khul'ah. And um, in English, we call that the backdoor divorce. Basically, if a man fails in us, there are six areas that if a man fails in them, a woman can leave the marriage. And I won't get too much into that, but I already gave you some examples of failing to protect, failing to provide, failing to be good in bed, right? Because then it's it's a problem with a person who's only supposed to sleep with one person, right? A Muslim man can have one, two, three, or up to four wives, but that woman is, she can only be with one man. So if she's not satisfied, then it creates a situation to where cheating could occur. And to avoid that, it's like, look, this isn't working out. <laughs> let me out of here. I'm telling you, I'm going to violate my religion if you don't let me out of here right now. And that is completely allowable. Um, so something that I just said about men being able to marry multiple women. Now, the Quran says, if you cannot do justice between these women, you should marry only one. And then it goes on to say that most men cannot. So that should let you know right there that most men <laughs> do not qualify to be in polygamous relationships. But those who can, I mean, equality down the middle, like whatever you give her, you give her whatever you do for her, you got to do for her. And if you can't do that, like like you might be unable to help yourself in your heart for who you have more affection for. But as far as how you treat them, you took her to Papa Do's Saturday night, next Saturday night. Number two is going to Papa Do's. Like, like you better be able to fit the bill, right? And that's why, again, most men, they cannot. They cannot and they should not. So, um, and the theme on my channel of masculinity and femininity, I hope that that has done something for the conversation because so many people, like if you look up masculinity and femininity, it doesn't give you much, to be completely honest. I mean, the best thing that studying masculinity and femininity will give you is, is yin and yang from from China. Yin and yang, excuse me. But if you just go to Webster's Dictionary, dictionary.com, thesaurus.com, it'll just say, oh, you know, that which is ever pertaining to men and boys. Well, thanks. That helps in a world like 2021. <laughs> You look up femininity. Oh, that which is cons uh, consistently and traditionally associated with women and girls. Well, that doesn't help in 2021 where everything is just, you know, a, a mishmash, uh, <laughs> hodgepodge of uh, identity, right? So I wanted to basically go to the Eastern world and expose to you um, traditions of masculinity and femininity, so let's say in the month of Ramadan, right? You have some of the most exaggerated, uh, one of the most exaggerated times of femininity and masculinity because men are working all day while they're fasting because they still have to provide. Sorry for you, buddy. You still need to go to work. Light bills still need to be paid. And women from their love and compassion for these men who have to go to work and, you know, they sweat and they don't get to drink something and they don't get to eat something, you know. Those women are up cooking all day, right? Smelling good food <laughs> around all the water, making all the juice and all the coffee and preparing all the meals and looking after the kids. And, you know, they're in the house, like, you know, cooking these meals so that everybody can eat and come over and break their fast together at sunset. So you have this very exaggerated form that, that just sort of kind of naturally happens, right? In the month of Ramadan, again, Muslims are not a monolith, so not everybody lives that way, but just in general, that's the way it goes on. So one of the things that um, Muslim men do, and I'm closing here, um, or that Islam prescribes is a mahr. Mahr is an Arabic word for uh, bride price. Some people translate it as dowry, but I think dowry, um, dowry can mean things that mehr just really doesn't include. So I like to say bride price. So 
let's say you go to somebody's, you know, daughter. Well, you wouldn't go to somebody's daughter in Islam because, you know, that could be sexual harassment. So you go to her father. <laughs> All right. This is another thing, right? You, you, you go to her father. And if she doesn't go, have a father, she's got an older brother. She's got an uncle. She's got a something. And if nothing else, you, you find an imam. <laughs> you you find somebody who can go to her who is decent and you know maybe you can her mother might have the privilege of giving her away if if the father is just dead and gone but even then you know there there's probably a male relative anyhow they can require from the suitor a certain something to ensure that she lives a good life with him and if they should break up that she has a good life after him what does that mean that means, and, and I love that, uh, my favorite is how Somali women do it, right? I've seen Pakistani women do this and Arab women uh, get their dowries and I think they're a bit extravagant uh, in, in some cases. But Somali women consistently say, hey, I need a full wardrobe of clothing. This, this is basic Somali wife, right? Basic. I need a full wardrobe of clothing, thus and so. I've seen girls get their clothing tailored to their exact body size. I need this many sets of gold, earrings, bracelets, rings, right? So in the event of, you know, like how Somalis had to flee a war, come to America, they could, they could like liquefy that gold and make it money, right? And, and make it do something for them. So gold, clothing, a fully furnished home or apartment with furniture that they pick out and, um... On top of that, maybe a certain amount of money in the bank. So let's say in America, you know, you want to have a good like $7,000 in savings. They can ask for all of that before they've ever slept with this man. And he has to deliver on that before he gets to sleep with her. Unless they decide that he's going to give her half prior and then half later, whatever, right? They can decide on something different, but traditionally he would have to fork all of that over. And some people might say, oh, that's hard on the man, you know, but it's like nothing is ever going to be as hard on him as motherhood. OK. Motherhood will kill you. Motherhood can kill you, can kill your body, can mess you up, can rip you from one side of your body to the next. Like like nothing. You know, um, as a mother bereaved myself. Uh, I didn't quite recover from uh, preeclampsia and the things that I suffered while I was in labor. So because of the cost of life and the investment biologically that the woman actually makes, she deserves those things. Now, some women will for- forego that and say, she, she, j- just give me a ring or, you know, just set up an apartment, set up a house. I'll be there. However, you know, women have the right to say, hey, I, I, I want the deed to a home. If you want to marry me, this is what I require. And in other countries, you know, she might need a driver <laughs> and a maid and a cook and a nanny, you know, in Kenya or somewhere. And she's, she's allowed to do that. So, again, their masculinity is contingent upon protecting and preserving motherhood and femininity in women. Right. Defending their country is is is, you know, defending their countries, defending their economies and um, the rights of people who are oppressed like men are charged with a lot in Islam. So when I see certain American men who are saying, oh, Muslim women are superior. I'm like, well, do you think Muslim men are superior? Because they got something going on that maybe you don't like (laughs) when you listen to what I, all the things that I've just said and what Muslim men are truly charged with, a woman would have to be some kind of ingrate, some kind of arrogant ingrate not to yield to a man who was capable of all of that. You would have to be some kind of disrespectful, ungrateful personality disorder having like, like if, if a man is doing all of that protecting and providing for you and giving you a comfortable life, and all that you need to educate and water and beautify your children in the best way possible. Helping you to take care of your mother, who is now his mother-in-law, who he may not know, but he knows you love her, so he gives you money for that. If you cannot yield and submit to that man in your home, you do not deserve him. 
And if you have a woman who was willing to basically live, you know, something like subservient to you in your home and you're not able to honor that, then you don't deserve her or her womb or her effort or her beauty or her comfort. You don't, you don't deserve that. If you're not able to truly honor the role that she is trying to play for you when she's making every meal and she's cleaning the house and she's taking care of all of your affairs and making you look good in front of your friends and giving you that social currency by by building you up, you know, ironing your clothes or whatever it was that you were required from her. Why did I say require three times? I think I'm thirsty. I think I need to have something to drink. But (laughs) anyhow, so this is... um masculinity and femininity in islam and i know that as a loosely practicing sufi there may be a lot of muslims in the comments who have things to add i'm sure there are things that i missed and this could never be a perfect message because i'm an imperfect messenger so if there is anything that i missed please comment down below i would love to hear it from you because i do think Whether or not you subscribe to any kind of religion, the masculinity and femininity, the male and female roles typically prescribed by Islam are um, archaic and traditional in a beautiful way. And it makes sense when you're looking at the biology and the physiology of men and women. And if you don't think so, feel free to disagree below. Let's have a conversation about it. I just, all I ask is that we're respectful to one another. All right. So, and if I think of something I forgot, I might just comment below myself. So I'm up at a unicorn. I thank you for listening. And, um... Let me know how this went for you because I definitely had second thoughts about even having this conversation because it's important to me for you all to know, again, that I'm no crusader. I am not, uh, I do not proselytize. I merely speak on what I know, what I've studied. I studied Islam in Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Qatar, and these are the things that I picked up. So... Like, share, comment, subscribe. I am Uppity Unicorn and I am out of here.